Good day. So good to be here with you after a bit of a break. It's been about three weeks since um, <clears throat> I've done a video uh, regarding the weekly message here at Redwater Alliance. Uh, we've had a marvelous couple of weeks where one Sunday we had Baptism Sunday and then last Sunday we had ordination ceremony for our associate pastor who went through the ordination process and we commissioned him and laid hands on him and his wife and it was just a just a wonderful wonderful service but now we're back on track uh, we we want to get back into the letter to the Ephesians to the sermon series Ephesians blueprint so uh, so good to be here with you thank you so much for having me in your places and I pray and hope that you've had uh, a wonderful wonderful week and I look forward to spending a few moments here with you in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, in future, too, as just for your information, there will be some time during the summer here, June, uh, July and into the August, where uh, we're going to only be recording, uh, audio recording our messages. Uh, I'm going to be going away for a while, and uh, just for a few weeks, three weeks, four weeks or so. And... Um, our associate pastor is going to do all the preaching and we're going to record the audio and somehow we'll figure out a way to get that to you probably by podcast or some sort of thing on YouTube and on Facebook and you can always go to our website as well uh, redwateralliancechurch.org so thank you so much again and um, just looking forward to engaging with Paul's letter again with you Dame Agatha Mary Clarissa Christie, that's a nice, beautiful name, was a well-known English author best known for her mystery detective novels and short stories. And maybe some of you are familiar with Agatha Christie. And Agatha Christie has been one of our favorites in our home for a long time. My wife Pat and I have pretty much exhausted all of the BBC's mysteries based on Agatha Christie's novels. Two of my favorite characters found in Christie's novels are the inexhaustible and brilliant Belgian detective Hercule Poirot and who can forget the lovable but intense spinster Miss Marple. And one of my favorite Christie mystery novels is, uh, the title is, And Then There Were None. And therein that story, Christie spins her uh, uh, her web of mystery surrounding eight people who upon receiving a personal invitation find themselves on a small isolated island off the coast of England and of course when you read in a novel this mystery novel this kind of setting you know something's up and there far from prying eyes Christie weaves her mystery with all the skill of the gifted mystery writer that she was and in the end, not one of the eight invited guests remains standing to tell the tale. Hence, and then there were none. Agatha's novel has become one of the best-selling books of all time with over 100 million copies sold. It's a wonderful, wonderful mystery story. From the world of fiction, my friends, to the world of reality, we find Jesus one time speaking to his disciples, explaining that he had come to reveal to them the mystery of the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 4, verse 11. The Apostle Paul, addressing the church at Colossae, said that he had been appointed by Christ to preach the mystery that had been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now had has been disclosed to the Lord's people. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 and 26. Well, my friends, please turn into the letter to the Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to read from chapter 3, verse 1 through to 13. Please join me. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can, when you read this, pardon me, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, 
as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Verse 11. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we just thank you. So glad to come back to this wonderful letter from your Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus so long ago. And I pray by your spirit that you would help us to understand not only in our minds, in our heads, but in our hearts, the implications of this letter to us. For it describes to us what the purpose of our lives are in the church and the purpose of the church in our current culture. And we thank you for Paul, who, by the inspiration of the Spirit, while in prison, in Roman prison, would write this letter, uh, a letter of praise in every sentence. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I've said, it's been three weeks since we last engaged with this letter to the Ephesian church. Today, as we get our heads and our hearts back in to Paul's letter, we need to be reminded of a few things. So when we began our study of Ephesians, we discovered that Paul, right from the get-go, had set the tone of his letter from the start when he said this in chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He set a tone of praise. You see, Paul had understood and received in his own life the wonder of God's gracious grace. That's the way he puts it, gracious grace in chapter 1, verse 5. And it was because of God's grace bestowed in his life that Paul would write this letter to the Ephesians to the praise of his glory. Chapter 1, verse 14. So with this in mind, what would you say if I told you that Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians while in prison for preaching the gospel? In Roman prison. Ephesians, along with Philippians and Colossians, and Paul's letter to his dear friend Philemon, were written while Paul was in a Roman prison. And for those of you who are wondering when, just because you're interested, somewhere between AD 60 and 62. Now just let's think out loud about this, about this situation, where Paul was when he wrote it and And the tone of this letter of praise. The tone itself might seem to some of us to be incongruent with Paul's circumstances in a Roman prison. Yet Paul's Roman jail would not hold back his joy in the gospel. We see this in his letter to Philippi, chapter 3, verse 8, where Paul there said, For his sake I have suffered, whose sake? Christ's sake. I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. That's a nice English uh, translation. Actually, it should be closer to the word dung. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. So the question really is, something for us to ponder here right at the start. Are you and I prepared in our context in the 21st century to suffer the loss of all things and count them rubbish in order to gain Christ? And what would our response be in suffering for Christ? Would it be as Paul had it, to the praise of his glory. You see, Paul, in his praise of all that God had done in his life, saw his time in the Roman prison as suffering, as he tells us here in verse 1, on behalf of you Gentiles. He saw that as suffering on behalf of others. 
Well, that's something for us to ponder the rest of our time together. But when we consider the text before us, please notice with me that Paul begins with a phrase here at verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1, that we have seen before, and we saw that in chapter 1, verse 15. And the phrase is, for this reason. And he repeats that phrase here again in chapter 3 and verse 14. But back in one, chapter 1, verse 15, the phrase, for this reason, was followed by a prayer. Here in chapter 3, verse 14, for this reason is also followed by a prayer. So one may conclude, possibly conclude, that Paul, here at chapter 3, verse 1, when he said, for this reason, a prayer would follow. But as you have heard the text, as you've read the text, this is not the case. It seems that Paul, wanting to pray, decided to interrupt his prayer by giving us a number of statements concerning a mystery of some sort. These we call parenthetical statements. Notice the word mystery, then. Well, it's found here three times in the very first six verses of our text, in verse 3, 4, and 6. In total, Paul uses this word mystery six times in his Ephesian letter. And of course, this is going to bring up some questions, and it should. And let's start with what does this word that is translated here in the ESV translation I am using, mystery, mean? And why don't we just even go even beyond this letter and apply the same uh, examination to the whole of the New Testament contest, content or context? How is it used in the whole of the New Testament? And in doing so, because, of course, we can't be so comprehensive here, time does not allow, let's just keep it simple. It will be sufficient for our time today. The word translated mystery in the New Testament is not in the mysterious sense as with our English word. The word we have here in the text in the original sense means, uh, according to BDAG, a Greek lexicon, means, quote, that which being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension. Let me read that one more time. Quote, that which being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension. In other words, something that is made known only by divine revelation. Therefore, the mystery that Paul speaks of here in this letter is not uh, knowledge being withheld, but it is truth being revealed. Not knowledge withheld, but truth revealed. And the truth that was revealed to Paul and the other apostles and prophets of the early church was revealed to them in God's own timing and by God's own purpose and choice. And Paul and the apostles of the day received the truth revealed from God by a revelation or by the illumination of the Spirit of God. And that is why Paul would say here in verse 3, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. And that the revelation Paul had received from God, Paul clarifies in his first letter to Corinth, that it was revealed to us, he said, to us they're referring to the apostles through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. With this in mind, and moving along to verse 4, please notice this verse. Let's read it together. When you read this, Paul said, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. What was Paul saying here? Well, the question is in verse 5. But let's read 4 and 5 together. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men and other generations, that is in the Old Testament, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. So here's the other question. What is this mystery that has been revealed to Paul? What is this mystery that the Ephesian believers would be able to perceive, to see? Well, the answer is back in verse 4. It is the mystery of Christ. In other words, his gospel. See, my friends, God in his redemptive purposes and plan chose a time, a place, 
and a person. A time, a place, and a person. The time, first century. The place, Judea. The person, his son, Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way in his Galatian letter. Paul said, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as son, as sons. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. God's redemptive purposes and his plans for the world has been revealed in one person, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. It was revealed in that process originally to the 12 apostles and to a former persecutor of the church, the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit of God. And it was the mystery of Christ. In verse 4, it reminds us of that revelation. The mystery of Christ is the gospel of Christ. Well, let's go back to verse 1. Let's go back to our phrase for this reason. And please notice that not only does this indicate that Paul intended to pray, but this is also pointing back to what Paul has said in chapter 2, verse 13 to 22. For the Ephesian Gentile believers at one time were separated from Christ, it tells us in those in those verses, that they had no hope and they were without God in the world, just like we were without Christ. But because they were in Christ Jesus, united to Christ now, they who were once far off had been brought near by the blood of Christ, Paul would say in chapter 2. So two distinct groups in that first century, the Jew and the Gentile, were brought near by the blood of Christ. And Paul summarizes chapter 2, verse 13 to 22, here at verse 6, when he said, This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. And Paul reminds you and me, he reminds us in his Roman letter, that all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, Romans 8, 14. That the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 16 and 20, 17. And the Holman uh, commentary uh, summarizes us and helps us locate the primary statement of all these statements that we find in verse 1 to 7. And in a nutshell, God had revealed to Paul by his spirit a message. And by virtue of this revelation, Paul had been made a minister of that message, which was the gospel of Christ, which was, was this in the end, that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile in Christ. Let's bear in mind that that was one of the, one of the, one of the uh, most hot, hotly debated questions of the first century church. How are the Gentiles now fitted into the people of God? Well... <laughs> the gospel solved that. So we can induce some things from this primary statement here in verse 1 to 7. That the church is a community, a community where there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. If you take that literally, you are going to have problems. We don't have the time to deal with all the bits in this verse. But we can say this, that it doesn't mean there's no diversity in the worldwide body of Christ. No, no uh, different languages, no different cultures. No, that's not what this is saying. And we can say along with my current uh, pastor, Alistair Begg, that God through Christ has created and brought together a new society. A new society. Well, friends, when we began our study in Ephesians, we were challenged by the question, who is the church? And with that question in the fore of our minds, we began our journey in discovering our place and purpose in Christ's church and our place and purpose as a church in our current cultural situation. Today, we add to the pieces we have learned to date, even though it's been a few weeks, I hope we can, you can look back and try and, and remember some of those things and even check out the videos if you've forgotten some things. We add to the pieces we learn to date those we have discovered in our text today. That God, who according to his holy Bible, is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. 2 Corinthians 5.19 
And if you're now saying to yourself, how? Well, the answer could not be any clearer because we've been talking about it for the last 15 minutes. God through Christ, through his new society, the church, is how God is doing this. Well, let's do a little bit of a time travel. Consider the 19th century with me. And uh, certainly the 19th century produced some of the most influential philosophers of their day. And their influence continues to ripple through our culture here in the 21st century. And one of the 19th century philosophers that stands really above all of them was Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche was a secularist whose worldview required that the people, that people deal head on with their weaknesses and the abundant troubles of their day. For Nietzsche to confront the suffering and evil in life was something that made one tougher, one, one stronger, one able to handle it. Nietzsche viewed Christianity as uh, the, quote, religion of pity. You see, for Nietzsche, Christianity was for weak people. He once said God is dead. A fellow by the name of Brett McCa McCa uh, McCracken, pardon me, Brett McCracken, in his article for the Gospel Coalition, said of Nietzsche's claims against Christianity, quote, was Nietzsche right? Was Christianity, as Nietzsche said, the religion of comfortableness, an escape system from the toughness of life, end quote? And Brett, in his article, answers his own questions with honesty and suggests, yes, there's been times in history when Christianity has been comfortable. The church has been unwilling to embrace the costly call of Jesus Christ. You know, when we consider our current evangelical culture today, and, and I'll just keep to North America per se, it doesn't take much effort to find that for many Christians today, Christianity has indeed become a, a religion of comfort. You see, faith now has become something that doesn't ask much of one, just one hour a week, maybe. It doesn't cost anything. Brett calls this in his article, he calls this moralistic therapeutic deism. I simply don't call it Christianity at all. And maybe Nietzsche was right to criticize this kind of Christianity. But then, as we have seen so far in Ephesians, even just today, Christianity doesn't, a, Christian, a Christianity doesn't ask much of one, and it doesn't cost anything, is not biblical Christianity. Paul is in jail because of his faith in Christ. Our study of Ephesians, at the very least, has shown us that the local church is not a social club that appeals and appeases the natural appetites of those who attend. And if this is the kind of church we are becoming or we are attending, then we are truly living, as one very popular preacher of the day has said, our best life now. And Apostle Paul, though, my friends, reminds us here in the text that the revelation of the gospel that was given to him was by the working of his power. Whose power? Paul said to the believers in Rome, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek, Romans 1.16. That's well worth memorizing that, that verse. Paul himself considered, who considered himself the least of the apostles, had been given the grace to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 8. Paul was appointed by Christ to bring light, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of mystery hidden for ages in God. That it was through the church that the manifold wisdom of God might, made, might be made known. Verse 10, known to who? Well, the answer is the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Verse 10, who? Answer, the angels of God and angels of Satan. That is the cosmic powers. How? By the church. God has created this new society, this new, uh, this thing, this place that we call the church around the world. And he's broadcasting to one and all in the cosmic realm, this is my plan. This is my plan, I have revealed it through the one and only person of my son, Jesus Christ. So let me ask now, considering what Paul has said here, is the mission of the local church to be relevant to the surrounding culture? Now that's a loaded question, it's not very 
well put. I don't have time to explain it, but let me ask you again and see maybe you can understand what I'm saying is the mission of the local church to be relevant to the surrounding culture. And as you ponder that question, let me share a comment from McCracken's article. Quote, true revel- relevance for the church will come in so far as we pay less attention to our seeming irrelevance in the world and more attention to our reverence of before God and faithfulness to our mission. Folks, the local church was never meant to be culturally relevant in every place and situation. It was never meant to be a comfortable place. It was never meant to be a social club which appeals to people's idolatry. And of course, the church is never one to instigate hatred in the culture. No, we are to love others as God has loved us. Doesn't mean we have to accept what they do, but we do have to love them. Faithfulness to Christ and his commands that we find in God's word are very good reasons to become unpopular in the culture. We need to understand that and embrace the fact that unpopularity is going to happen, but let it happen for the right reasons. McCracken was right when he said, quote, we must always remember and keep front and center the church's radical and countercultural mission. My brothers and sisters, the church is not about us. It's not about our preferences, our desires, our self-esteem, our promotion. It's not about self. And why don't we just stop taking those selfies? The church is to be other-centered. Jesus said it very clearly to his disciples, and he's saying it to us today. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Friends, the greatest danger of the church is not from the outside, it's from the inside. And the greatest danger is ourselves. Our narcissistic tendencies to the church and selfish desires and selfish natures. The desire to be free from God is the greatest danger to the church. Christ has placed us in the local church to be the salt of the earth. And Jesus said, if the salt loses its taste, how shall salt, saltiness be restored? It cannot be. It'll be thrown in the dirt. Matthew 5, 13. Christ has placed us in the local church to be the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14. Jesus even said to his disciples, as he says to us today, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. The church is where Christ brings a new society together, a society that offers the world an alternative, a sanctuary, a place of healing, a place of real hope, a society that in the society that one day in the fullness of God's time will include a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for this wonderful letter, for the gift of grace you gave to the Apostle Paul, once who was a persecutor of the church, now a revealer of Christ. May we, as we go from here today, as we go from our places, be revealers of Christ to others. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, it's so good to be back with you. God bless you. Shalom.